This is the Sabbath School lesson for the fourth quarter, 2021. Lesson 11 from our series Present Truth in Deuteronomy is titled Deuteronomy in the Later Writings, ready for teaching on December 11, and I'm Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, December 4. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the book of Deuteronomy, which is part of your word. And we thank you that as we trace it through the rest of the Bible, that we see that not only are you there talking to us, but there is a consistency in your word. And today we pray that as we open your word, your Holy Spirit will guide us and bless us. But today, Lord, I'd like to pray for each of us who have been affected by COVID-19. There's not a country where this podcast is heard where COVID-19 has not caused a major problem. And Lord, we just ask that each of us may be able to do what we can to protect those around us, to help those who need help, and to show your love and kindness. Bless us, each one, as we study your word this week, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse 15. The Lord delighted only in your fathers to love them, and he chose their descendants after them, you above all peoples, as it is this day. Let's read that again, Deuteronomy 10, 15. The Lord delighted only in your fathers to love them, and he chose their descendants after them, you above all peoples, as it is this day. One of the fascinating things about the Bible, especially the Old Testament, is how often it refers or alludes to itself. That is, later writers in the Old Testament refer to earlier ones, using them and their writings to make their point. Psalm 81, for example, goes back to the book of Exodus and then almost quotes verbatim from the preamble of the Ten Commandments when the psalmist writes in verse 10, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. All through the Old Testament, Genesis, especially the creation story, is referenced, such as in, I beheld the earth, and indeed it was without form and void, and the heavens they had no light, Jeremiah 4.23. And this is quoting from Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And yes, many times the later writers of the Old Testament, such as the prophets, referred back to the book of Deuteronomy, which played such a central role in the covenantal life of early Israel. This week, we will focus on how the book was used by later writers. What parts of Deuteronomy did they use, and what points were they making that have relevance for us today? Sunday, December 5, the Book of the Law. King Josiah of Judah, who was eight years old when he became king, reigned 31 years, from 640 BC to 609 BC, before his death on the battlefield. In the 18th year of his reign, something happened that, at least for a while, changed the history of God's people. Read 2 Kings chapter 22. We begin at verse 1. Josiah was eight years old when he became king, and he reigned thirty-one years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jedidah, the daughter of Adiah of Bokzkath. And he did what was right in the sight of the Lord, and walked in all the ways of his father David. He did not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. 
Now it came to pass in the eighteenth year of King Josiah that the king sent Shaphan the scribe, the son of Azaliah, the son of Meshalam, to the house of the Lord, saying, Go up to Hilkiah the high priest, that he may count the money which has been brought into the house of the Lord, which the doorkeepers have gathered from the people, and let them deliver it into the hand of those doing the work who are the overseers in the house of the Lord. Let them give it to those who are in the house of the Lord, doing the work to repair the damages of the house, to carpenters and builders and masons, and to buy timber and hewn stone to repair the house. However, there need be no accounting made with them of the money delivered into their hand, because they deal faithfully. Then Hilkiah the high priest said to Shaphan the scribe, I have brought the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan, and he read it. So Shaphan the scribe went to the king, bringing the king word, saying, Your servants have gathered the money that was found in the house, and have delivered it into the hand of those who do the work, who oversee the house of the Lord. Then Shaphan the scribe showed the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest has given me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. Now it happened, when the king heard the words of the book of the law, that he tore his clothes. Then the king commanded Hilkiah the priest, Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, Achbor, the son of Micaiah, Shaphan, the scribe, and Asiah, a servant of the king, saying, Go inquire of the Lord for me, for the people, and for all Judah, concerning the words of this book that has been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is aroused against us, because our fathers have not obeyed the words of this book, to do according to all that is written concerning us. So Hilkiah the priest, Achim, Akbar, Shaphan, and Asiah went to Huldah the prophetess, the wife of Shalom, the son of Tikvah, the son of Hahas, keeper of the wardrobe. She dwelt in Jerusalem in the second quarter, and they spoke with her. Then she said to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Tell the man who sent you to me, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will bring calamity on this place and on its inhabitants, all the words of the book which the king of Judah has read, because they have forsaken me and burned incense to other gods, that they might provoke me to anger with all the works of their hands. Therefore my wrath shall be aroused against this place, and shall not be quenched. But... As for the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire of the Lord, in this manner you shall speak to him. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, concerning the words which you have heard, because your heart was tender, and you humbled yourself before the Lord when you heard what I spoke against this place and against its inhabitants, that they would become a desolation and a curse, and you tore your clothes and wept before me, I also have heard you, says the Lord. Surely, therefore, I will gather you to your fathers, and you shall be gathered to your grave in peace. And your eyes shall not see all the calamity which I will bring on this place. So they brought back word to the king. Scholars have long concluded that the book of the law, 2 Kings 22 verse 8, was Deuteronomy, which apparently had been lost to the people for many years. Ellen White writes in Prophets and Kings, page 393, Josiah was deeply stirred as he heard read for the first time the exhortations and warnings recorded in this ancient manuscript. Never before had he realized so fully the plainness with which God had set before Israel life and death, blessing and cursing in Deuteronomy 30.19. The book abounded in assurances of God's willingness to save to the uttermost those who should place their trust fully in him. As he had wrought in their deliverance from Egyptian bondage, so would he work mightily in establishing them in the land of promise and in placing them at the head of the nations of earth. End of quote. 
All through the next chapter, we can see just how seriously King Josiah sought to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart and all his soul in 2 Kings 23 verse 3. We're also referred to Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 29. But from there you will seek the Lord your God and you will find him if you seek him with all your heart and with all your soul. And Deuteronomy 6 verse 5, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And Deuteronomy 10 verse 12, And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul. And Deuteronomy 11.13 And it shall be that if you earnestly obey my commandments, which I command you today, to love the Lord your God and serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. And this reformation included a cleansing and purging of all the abominations that were seen in the land of Judah and in Jerusalem, that he might perform the words of the law which were written in the book that Hilkiah the priest found in the house of the Lord, 2 Kings 23-24. Deuteronomy was filled with warnings and admonitions against following the practices of the nations around them. The actions of Josiah and all the things that he did, which included the execution of what must have been idolatrous priests in Samaria, recorded in 2 Kings 23.20, revealed just how far the people of God had strayed from the truth entrusted to them. Instead of remaining the holy people they were supposed to be, they compromised with the world, even though they often thought, we are just fine with the Lord, thank you. What a dangerous deception. And so to finish the day, in our own homes or even in church institutions, what things might we need to purge thoroughly in order truly to serve the Lord with all our heart and soul? Monday, December 6, the Heaven of Heavens. Deuteronomy makes it so clear that the law and the covenant were central not only to Israel's relationship to God, but also to the nation's purpose as the chosen people. We read this in three texts, Deuteronomy 7, 6, For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. And chapter 14, verse 2, For you are a holy people to the Lord your God, and the Lord has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above Above all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. And chapter 18, verse 5. For the Lord your God has chosen you out of all your tribes to stand to minister in the name of the Lord, him and his sons forever. Read Deuteronomy 10, verses 12 to 15, where much of this idea of law and Israel's chosen status is stressed. What, however, does the Bible mean by the phrase, heaven of heavens? What point is Moses making with that phrase? Deuteronomy 10, beginning at verse 12. And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways and to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes which I command you today for your good? Indeed, Heaven and the highest heavens belong to the Lord your God, also the earth with all that is in it. The Lord delighted only in your fathers to love them, and he chose their descendants after them, you above all peoples, as it is this day. What heaven of heavens means isn't absolutely clear, at least in this immediate context. But Moses is pointing to the majesty, power and grandeur of God. 
That is, not only heaven itself, but also the heaven of the heavens belongs to him, most likely an idiomatic expression that points to God's complete sovereignty over all creation. Read the following verses, all based on the phrase that appears first in Deuteronomy. In each case, what point is being made, and how do we see the influence of Deuteronomy there? First of all, 1 Kings 8, verse 27. But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain you, how much less this temple which I have built. Nehemiah 9, verse 6. You alone are the Lord, you have made heaven, the heaven of heavens with all their host, the earth and everything on it, the seas and all that is in them, and you preserve them all. The host of heaven worships you. And Psalm 148, verse 4. Praise him, you heavens of heavens, and the waters above the heavens. Especially clear in Nehemiah 9 is the theme of God as the Creator and the One who alone should be worshipped. He made everything, even the heaven of heavens with all their hosts, verse 6 of chapter 9. In fact, Nehemiah 9.3 says that he read from the book of the law, most likely as in the time of Josiah, the book of Deuteronomy, which explains why a few verses later the Levites, amid their praise and worship of God, used the phrase, heaven of heavens, which came directly from Deuteronomy. And so to finish today, God is the creator not only of earth, but also of the heaven of heavens. And then to think that this same God went to the cross... Why is worship such an appropriate response to what God has done for us? Tuesday, December 7. Deuteronomy in Jeremiah Years ago, a young man, an agnostic, was a passionate seeker for truth, whatever that truth was and wherever it led him. Eventually, he came not only to believe in God the Father and in Jesus, but he also accepted the Seventh-day Adventist message. His favourite verse in the Bible was Jeremiah 29.13, which reads, And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Years later, however, he found that verse again while studying his Bible, but way back in the book of Deuteronomy. That is, Jeremiah got it from Moses. Read Deuteronomy 4, 23-29. What is the context of this promise to Israel, and how could it relate to us today? Deuteronomy 4, beginning at verse 23. Take heed to yourselves, lest you forget the covenant of the Lord your God, which he made with you, and make for yourselves a carved image in the form of anything which the Lord your God has forbidden you. For the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God." When you beget children and grandchildren and have grown old in the land and act corruptly and make a carved image in the form of anything and do evil in the sight of the Lord your God to provoke him to anger, I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day that you will soon utterly perish from the land which you cross over the Jordan to possess. You will not prolong your days in it, but will be utterly destroyed, and the Lord will scatter you among the peoples and you will be left few in number among the nations where the Lord will drive you. And there you will serve gods, the work of men's hands, wood and stone, which neither see nor hear nor eat nor smell. But from there you will seek the Lord your God, and you will find him if you seek him with all your heart and with all your soul. As we already have seen, the book of Deuteronomy had been rediscovered during the reign of King Josiah, and it was under Josiah's rule that Jeremiah began his ministry. No wonder, then, that the influence of Deuteronomy can be seen in the writings of Jeremiah. Read Jeremiah chapter 7, verses 1 to 7. What is Jeremiah telling the people to do, and 
How does it relate to what had been written in the book of Deuteronomy? Jeremiah 7, beginning at verse 1, the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Stand in the gate of the Lord's house, and proclaim there this word, and say, Hear the word of the Lord, all you of Judah who enter in at these gates to worship the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Amend your ways and your doings, and I will cause you to dwell in this place. Do not trust in these lying words, saying, The temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. For if you thoroughly amend your ways and your doings, if you thoroughly execute judgment between a man and his neighbour, if you do not oppress the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this place, or walk after other gods to your hurt, then I will cause you to dwell in this place, in the land that I gave to your fathers, for ever and ever. Again and again in Deuteronomy, Moses stressed how the Israelites' existence in the land of Canaan was conditional, and that if they disobeyed, they would not remain in the place that God had chosen for them. Look at the particular warning in Jeremiah 7 verse 4. Do not trust in these lying words, saying, The temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these... The implication being that, yes, this was God's temple, and yes, they were the chosen people, but none of that mattered if they weren't obedient. And that obedience included how they treated strangers, orphans, and widows, an idea that goes directly back to Deuteronomy and some of the covenant stipulations that were incumbent upon them to follow. As in Deuteronomy 24.17, You shall not pervert justice due the stranger or the fatherless, nor take a widow's garment as a pledge. And we're also going to look at Deuteronomy 24 and verse 21. When you gather the grapes of your vineyard, you shall not glean it afterwards. It shall be for the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow. And um, chapter 10, verse 18 and 19. He administers justice for the fatherless and the widow, and loves the stranger, giving him food and clothing. Therefore, love the stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. And chapter 27, verse 19. Cursed is the one who perverts the justice due the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow. And all the people shall say, Amen. And so to finish the day, read Jeremiah 4, 4 and compare it to Deuteronomy 30, verse 6. What is the message there to the people and how does the principle equally apply to God's people today? Jeremiah 4, 4. Circumcise yourselves to the Lord and take away the foreskins of your hearts, you men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my fury come forth like fire and burn so that no one can quench it because of the evil of your doings. And chapter 30, verse 6 of Deuteronomy. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, that you may live. Wednesday, December 8. What does the Lord require? So much of the writings of the prophets consisted of appeals to faithfulness, and not just faithfulness in general, but in particular faithfulness to the Israelites' end of the covenant, which was reaffirmed just before they entered the land. This is what the book of Deuteronomy depicted, the reaffirmation of God's covenant with Israel. The Lord was now, after the forty-year detour, about to fulfil, or to begin to fulfil, more of his covenant promises, his end of the deal. Thus, Moses admonished the people to fulfil their end as well. Indeed, much of the writings of the prophets was basically the same, appeals for the people to uphold their side of the covenant. Read Micah 6 verses 1 to 8. What is the Lord telling the people there, and how does it relate to the book of Deuteronomy? 
We'll also look at Amos 5.24 and Hosea 6 verse 6. But first of all, Micah 6 beginning at verse 1. Hear now what the Lord says. Arise, plead your case before the mountains, and let the hills hear your voice. Hear, O you mountains, the Lord's complaint, and the strong foundations of the earth. For the Lord has a complaint against his people, and he will contend with Israel. O my people, what have I done to you, and how have I wearied you? Testify against me, for I brought you up from the land of Egypt, I redeemed you from the house of bondage, and I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. O my people, remember now what Balak king of Moab counseled, and what Balaam the son of Beor answered him from Acacia Grove to Gilgal, that you may know the righteousness of the Lord. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, ten thousand rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly, with your God, and Amos 5.24, but let justice run down like water, and righteousness like a mighty stream, and Hosea 6, verse 6, for I desire mercy and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. Bible scholars have seen in these verses in Micah what is known as a covenant lawsuit, in which the Lord sues or brings a case against his people for violation of the covenant. In this case, Micah says that the Lord has a complaint against his people in verse 2, in which the word complaint, riv, R-I-V, can mean a legal dispute. That is, the Lord was bringing a legal case against them, imagery that implies the legal besides the relational aspect of the covenant. This shouldn't be surprising because, after all, central to the covenant was law. Notice, too, how Micah borrows language directly from Deuteronomy. And this quote is from Deuteronomy 10, verses 12 and 13. O now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways and to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command you today for your good. Instead, though, of quoting it directly, Micah modifies it by exchanging the letter of the law of Deuteronomy for the spirit of the law, which is about being just and merciful. What seems to be happening here is that whatever the outward appearance of religion and piety, lots of animal sacrifices, that is, thousands of rams, that's not what constitutes Israel's covenant relationship with God. What good is all this outward piety if, for example, they covet fields and take them by violence, also houses, and seize them, so they oppress a man and his house, a man and his inheritance? Micah 2 Verse 2. Israel was supposed to be a light to the world, about which the nations would say with wonder in Deuteronomy 4 verse 6, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. Hence, they were to act with wisdom and with understanding, which included treating people with justice and mercy. Thursday, December 9, Daniel's Prayer. One of the most famous prayers in all the Old Testament is in Daniel chapter 9. 
having learned from reading the prophet Jeremiah that the time of Israel's desolation, as recorded in Daniel 9.2, 70 years, was soon to be up, Daniel earnestly began praying. And what a prayer it was, a poignant and tearful supplication in which he confessed his sins and the sins of his people while at the same time acknowledging God's justice amid the calamity that had befallen them. Read Daniel 9, verses 1 to 19. What themes can you find that directly relate back to the book of Deuteronomy? Daniel 9, beginning at verse 1. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the lineage of the Medes, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish seventy years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Then I set my face toward the Lord God to make request by prayer and supplication with fasting, sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession and said, O Lord, great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant and mercy with those who love him and with those who keep his commandments, we have sinned and committed iniquity. We have done wickedly and rebelled, even by departing from your precepts and your judgments. Neither have we heeded your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings and our princes, to our fathers, and all the people of the land. O Lord, righteousness belongs to you, but to us shame of face, as it is this day, to the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and all Israel, those near and those far off in all the countries to which you have driven them, because of the unfaithfulness which they have committed against you. O Lord, to us belong shame of face to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, because we have sinned against you. To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against him. We have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. Yes, all Israel has transgressed your law, and has departed so as not to obey your voice. Therefore the curse and the oath written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out on us, because we have sinned against him. And he has confirmed his words, which he spoke against us and against our judges who judged us, by bringing upon us a great disaster. For under the whole heaven such has never been done as what has been done to Jerusalem. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this disaster has come upon us, yet we have not made our prayer before the Lord our God that we might turn from our iniquities and understand your truth. Therefore the Lord has kept the disaster in mind and brought it upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous in all the works which he does, though we have not obeyed his voice. And now, O Lord our God, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand, and made yourself a name as it is this day. We have sinned, we have done wickedly. O Lord, according to all your righteousness, I pray, let your anger and your fury be turned away from your city Jerusalem, your holy mountain, because for our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people are a reproach to all those around us. Now therefore, our God, hear the prayer of your servant and his supplications, and for the Lord's sake, cause your face to shine on your sanctuary which is desolate. O oh my God, incline your ear and hear, open your eyes and see our desolations and the city which is called by your name. For we do not present our supplications before you because of our righteous deeds, but because of your great mercies. O oh Lord, hear, O oh Lord, forgive. O Lord, listen and act. Do not delay for your own sake, my God, for your city and your people are called by your name. Daniel's prayer is a summary of exactly what the nation had been warned about in Deuteronomy regarding the fruits of not keeping their end of the covenant. 
Twice Daniel referred back to the law of Moses in verses 11 and 13, which certainly included Deuteronomy, and in this case might have been specifically referring to it. As Deuteronomy had said, they were driven from the land because they didn't obey exactly what Moses had told them would happen in Deuteronomy 31.29. Let's look at Deuteronomy 4.27-31. And the Lord will scatter you among the peoples, and you will be left few in number among the nations where the Lord will drive you. And there you will serve gods, the work of men's hands, wood and stone, which neither see nor hear nor eat nor smell, But from there you will seek the Lord your God, and you will find him if you seek him with all your heart and with all your soul. When you are in distress and all these things come upon you in the latter days, when you turn to the Lord your God and obey his voice, for the Lord your God is a merciful God, he will not forsake you nor destroy you, nor forget the covenant of your fathers which he swore to them." And Deuteronomy chapter 28, Now it shall come to pass, if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God, to observe carefully all his commandments which I command you today, that the Lord your God will set you high above all nations of the earth, and all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you, because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. Blessed shall you be in the city, and blessed shall you be in the country." Blessed shall be the fruit of your body, the produce of your ground, and the increase of your herds, the increase of your cattle, and the offspring of your flocks. Blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed shall you be when you come in, and blessed shall you be when you go out. The Lord will cause your enemies who rise against you to be defeated before your face. They shall come out against you one way, and flee before you seven ways." The Lord will command the blessing on you in your storehouses and in all to which you set your hand, and he will bless you in the land which the Lord your God is giving you. The Lord will establish you as a holy people to himself, just as he has sworn to you, if you keep the commandments of the Lord your God and walk in his ways. Then all peoples of the earth shall see that you are named by the name of the Lord, and they shall be afraid of you. And the Lord will grant you plenty of goods in the fruit of your body, in the increase of your livestock, and in the produce of your ground, in the land of which the Lord swore to your fathers to give you. The Lord will open to you his good treasure, the heavens, to give the rain to your land in its season, and to bless all the work of your hand. You shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. And the Lord will make you the head and not the tail, and shall be above only and not beneath. If you heed the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today, and are careful to observe them, so you shall not turn aside from any of the words which I command you this day, to the right or the left, to go after other gods to serve them. But it shall come to pass, if you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God, to observe carefully all his commandments and his statutes which I command you today, that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. Cursed shall you be in the city, and cursed shall you be in the country. Cursed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Cursed shall be the fruit of your body and the produce of your land, the increase of your cattle and the offspring of your flocks. Cursed shall you be when you come in, and cursed shall you be when you go out." The Lord will send on you cursing, confusing, and rebuke in all that you set your hand to do until you are destroyed and until you perish quickly because of the wickedness of your doings in which you have forsaken me. The Lord will make the plague cling to you until he has consumed you from the land which you are going to possess. The Lord will strike you with consumption, with fever, with inflammation, with severe burning fever, with the sword, with scorching, and with mildew. They shall pursue you until you perish, and your heavens which are over your head shall be bronze, and the earth which is under you shall be iron. The Lord will change the rain of your land to powder and dust. From the heaven it shall come down on you until you are destroyed." 
the Lord will cause you to be defeated before your enemies. You shall go out one way against them and flee seven ways before them, and you shall become troublesome to all the kingdoms of the earth. Your carcasses shall be food for all the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth, and not one shall frighten them away. The Lord will strike you with the boils of Egypt, with tumours and the scab, and with the itch from which you cannot be healed." The Lord will strike you with madness and blindness and confusion of heart, and you shall grope at noonday, as a blind man gropes in darkness. You shall not prosper in your ways. You shall be only oppressed and plundered continually, and no one shall save you. You shall betroth a wife, but another man shall lie with her. You shall build a house, but you will not dwell in it. You shall plant a vineyard, but shall not gather its grapes. Your ox shall be slaughtered before your eyes, but you shall not eat of it. Your donkey shall be violently taken away from before you, and shall not be restored to you. Your sheep shall be given to your enemies, and you shall have no one to rescue them. Your sons and your daughters shall be given to other people, and your eyes shall look and fail with longing for them all day long. And there shall be no strength in your hand. A nation whom you have not known shall eat the fruit of your land and the produce of your labour, and you shall be only oppressed and crushed continually. So you shall be driven mad because of the sight which your eyes see. The Lord will strike you in the knees and on the legs with severe boils which cannot be healed, and from the sole of your foot to the top of your head. The Lord will bring you and the king whom you set over you to a nation which neither you nor your fathers have known. And there you shall serve other gods, wood and stone. And you shall become an astonishment, a proverb and a byword among all nations where the Lord will drive you. You shall carry much seed out to the field, but gather little in, for the locust shall consume it. You shall plant vineyards and tend them, but you shall neither drink of the wine nor gather the grapes, for the worms shall eat them. You shall have olive trees throughout all your territory, but you shall not anoint yourself with the oil, for your olives shall drop off. You shall beget sons and daughters, but they shall not be yours, for they shall go into captivity. Locusts shall consume all your trees and the produce of your land." The alien who is among you shall rise higher and higher above you, and you shall come down lower and lower. He shall lend to you, but you shall not lend to him. He shall be the head, and you shall be the tail. Moreover, all these curses shall come upon you and pursue and overtake you until you are destroyed, because you did not obey the voice of the Lord your God to keep his commandments and statutes which he commanded you, and they shall be upon you for a sign and a wonder on your descendants forever. Because you did not serve the Lord your God with joy and gladness of heart for the abundance of everything, therefore you shall serve your enemies whom the Lord will send against you in hunger, in thirst, in nakedness, and in need of everything. And he will put a yoke of iron on your neck until he has destroyed you. The Lord will bring a nation against you from afar, from the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flies, a nation whose language you will not understand, a nation of fierce countenance, which does not respect the elderly, nor show favour to the young. And they shall eat the increase of your livestock and the produce of your land, until you are destroyed." They shall not leave you grain, or new wine, or oil, or the increase of your cattle, or the offspring of your flocks, until they have destroyed you. They shall besiege you at all your gates, until your high and fortified walls in which you trust come down throughout all your land. And they shall besiege you at all your gates throughout all your land, which the Lord your God has given you. You shall eat the fruit of your own body, the flesh of your sons and your daughters, whom the Lord your God has given you, in the siege and desperate straits in which your enemy shall distress you. The sensitive and very refined man among you will be hostile toward his brother, toward the wife of his bosom, and toward the rest of his children whom he leaves behind, so that he will not give any of them the flesh of his children whom he will eat, because he has nothing left in the siege and desperate straits in which your enemy shall distress you, 
at all your gates. The tender and delicate woman among you, who would not venture to set the sole of her foot on the ground because of her delicateness and sensitivity, will refuse to the husband of her bosom, and to her son, and to her daughter, her placenta which comes out from between her feet, and her children whom she bears, for she will eat them secretly for lack of everything in the siege and desperate straits in which your enemy shall distress you at all your gates. If you do not carefully observe all the words of the law that are written in this book, that you may fear this glorious and awesome name, the Lord your God, then the Lord will bring upon you and your descendants extraordinary plagues, great and prolonged plagues, and serious and prolonged sicknesses. Moreover, he will bring back on you all the diseases of Egypt, of which you were afraid, and they shall cling to you. Also every sickness and every plague which is not written in this book of the law will the Lord bring upon you until you are destroyed. You shall be left few in number, whereas you were as the stars of heaven in multitude, because you would not obey the voice of the Lord your God. And it shall be that just as the Lord rejoiced over you to do you good and multiply you, so the Lord will rejoice over you to destroy you and bring you to nothing, and you shall be plucked from off the land which you go to possess. Then the Lord will scatter you among all peoples, from one end of the earth to the other, and there you shall serve other gods which neither you nor your fathers have known, wood and stone, and among those nations you shall find no rest, nor shall the sole of your foot have a resting place, but there the Lord will give you a trembling heart, failing eyes, and anguish of soul. Your life shall hang in doubt before you, you shall fear day and night, and have no assurance of life. In the morning you shall say, Oh, that it was evening, and at evening you shall say, Oh, that it were morning, because of the fear which terrifies your heart, and because of the sight which your eyes see. And the Lord will take you back to Egypt in ships, by the way in which I said to you, you shall never see it again. And there you shall be offered for sale to your enemies as male and female slaves, but no one will buy you. How tragic, too, that instead of the nations around them saying, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people, in Deuteronomy 4.6, Israel became a reproach, as we read in Daniel 9.16, to those same nations. In all of Daniel's tears and supplications, he never asked the common question that so many ask when disaster strikes, Why? He never asked because, thanks to the book of Deuteronomy, he knew exactly why all these things happened. In other words, Deuteronomy gave Daniel and other exiles a context in which to understand that the evil that came upon them wasn't just blind fate, blind chance, but the fruits of their disobedience, exactly what they had been warned about. But, and perhaps more important, Daniel's prayer expressed the reality that despite these events, there was hope. God had not abandoned them, no matter how much it might have seemed that way. Deuteronomy not only provided a context for understanding their situation, but it also pointed to the promise of restoration as well. So to finish the day, read Daniel 9 verses 24 to 27, the prophecy of Jesus and his death on the cross. Why would this prophecy be given to Daniel and to the rest of us in the context of Israel's exile and the promise of the people's return? Let's read Daniel 9 verses 24 to 27. Seventy weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and sixty-two weeks, the street shall be built again, and the wall, even in troublesome times. And after the sixty-two weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. 
And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood. And like the end of the war, desolations are determined. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. Friday, December 10. From Ralph L. Smith's Word Biblical Commentary, Volume 32, on Micah and Malachi, published in 1984, page 50, we read, This, Micah 6, 1-8, is one of the great passages of the Old Testament. It, like Amos 5.24 and Hosea 6.6, epitomizes the message of the 8th century prophets. The passage opens with a beautiful example of a covenant lawsuit in which the prophet summons the people to hear the charge Yahweh has against them. The mountains and hills are the jury because they have been around a long time and have witnessed God's dealing with Israel. Rather than directly charging Israel with breaking the covenant, God asks Israel if they have any charges against him. What have I done? How have I wearied you? In the face of injustice, some of the poor people may have become weary in well-doing. In the face of opportunities to get rich quick, some of the landowners might have grown weary of keeping the covenant laws. End of quote. And then from Prophets and Kings, page 401. In the Reformation that followed, the king, that's Josiah, turned his attention to the destruction of every vestige of idolatry that remained. So long had the inhabitants of the land followed the customs of the surrounding nations in bowing down to images of wood and stone, that it seemed almost beyond the power of men to remove every trace of these evils. But Josiah persevered in his effort to cleanse the land. And that brings us to our three discussion questions for this week. One, Sure, we're Seventh-day Adventists, and with our present truth message, we see ourselves, and rightly so, in the same place that the people of ancient Israel had been in, having truths that the world around them needed to hear. It's a great privilege for us. How well, though, do you think we're living up to the responsibilities that come with such privilege? Two, imagine being Daniel, having seen your nation invaded and defeated, and knowing that the temple, the centre of your whole religious faith, was destroyed by idolatrous pagans. How, though, could knowledge of the book of Deuteronomy have been very faith-sustaining for him or any other Jew at that time? That is, how did the book help him understand all that was happening and why it happened? In a similar way, how does our understanding of Scripture as a whole help us deal with trying times and events that otherwise, without our knowledge of Scripture, could be very discouraging to us? What should the answer teach us about how central the Bible must be to our faith? And three, in class, go over the 70-week prophecy of Daniel 9, 24-27. What role does the covenant have in that prophecy? And why is the idea of covenant so important to it and to us? Inside Story Our mission story this week is titled God's Perfect Timing, and it's by Elaine Hoshikawa Imayoki. Marcia Yuasa, one of thousands of Brazilian immigrants working long hours at factories in central Japan, was forced to stay at home after falling ill. Suffering severe pain, she didn't know how she could take care of her family or even survive. 
She cried out to God not to let her die. Unable to do much in her ill condition, she spent a lot of time on the internet. One day she stumbled across an online series of Bible-based health courses by a Seventh-day Adventist physician in Brazil. She watched every YouTube video that she could find, and as she learned about various aspects of a healthy lifestyle, she also heard about the Seventh-day Sabbath. Then, while looking on social media for friends from her youth in Brazil, she found a former classmate who recently had created a profile. Marcia happily reconnected with her old friend and enthusiastically told her in a call about her new finding on health and the Sabbath. The friend listened attentively, and when Marcia finished, said she worshipped Jesus on the Sabbath. She had become a Seventh-day Adventist after losing contact with Marcia. The two women began to study the Bible together. After some time, the friend sent contact information for an Adventist church and its pastor in her region. But when Marcia looked up the church's address, she realised that it was in another city, too far away to visit because she did not drive. Still, she called the church and spoke with me, the pastor's wife. To her surprise, I informed her that a small Bible study group had been formed in Awata, the city where she lived, and would meet for the first time that same week. Three days later, the group met less than a mile, actually a kilometre, from Marcia's house, so close that she could walk there. God has healed her illness, and Marcia, 54, has not missed a meeting since. Marcia learned about the Seventh-day Sabbath through the internet. Part of this quarter's 13th Sabbath offering will go to a project to help many Japanese people, especially young people, learn about Jesus through the internet. Thank you for planning a generous offering. And there's a lovely photograph there. I'm not sure whether it's Marcia or whether it's Elaine. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. Sponsored by the Sabbath School Department and distributed through Hope Channel Australia, this podcast is also redistributed by Hope Channel Germany, Christian Record Services for the Blind, and It Is Written. It is also available on SoundCloud and through multiple podcast distributors, including Apple iTunes. Remember, God is always faithful.